Trapped in a never-ending war, the Yemen conflict has dragged on more than two years. But how can it be ended, and can Yemen continue to even operate as a state? This is Roundtable with me, Matthew Moore. Well, it's been called the Forgotten War, one that's seen thousands die, millions displaced, and now the worst cholera epidemic since 2011. Saudi-led airstrikes in Yemen have drawn international criticism. But with the war now in its third year, is the Saudi-led coalition ready to end its efforts in Yemen? We are doing our best to create conditions for the present stalemate to be overcome. <laughs> We remind all parties to the conflict, including the coalition, of their duty to ensure full respect for international humanitarian law. More than two years into the war, and no side appears close to a decisive victory in Yemen. As the humanitarian crisis worsens, has Saudi Arabia's military intervention failed? When the Houthis swept through the country and seized the capital Sana'a in 2014, it was a red line for neighboring Saudi Arabia. Backed by a Sunni Arab coalition, they began an air campaign aimed at restoring the internationally recognized government. They accused Iran of backing the Houthis, and Yemen became the staging ground for a proxy war between the two old rivals. But two and a half years on, many are asking what the Saudi-led coalition has achieved. Their bombing campaign has come under fire from rights groups who accuse Riyadh of committing war crimes. Over 10,000 people have been killed and more than 3 million have been forced to flee their homes. Despite this all-out blockade, the Houthis haven't been defeated and still control the capital. Riyadh's involvement in the conflict is coming under increased scrutiny from the international community, and the increased instability has given free reign to Al-Qaeda militants in the country. With little operational or tactical impact on the ground, how long is the conflict likely to last? One of the Saudis' key military objectives was to restore President Hadi, Yet the war has caused division even amongst his most loyal supporters. With all parties accused of violating international human rights laws, is it possible for the international community to put a decisive end to this ongoing conflict? Well, at the round table today is Kim Sharif. She's the director of human rights for Yemen, a group campaigning for persecuted groups in the country. David Hurst, the editor-in-chief of the online news portal Middle East Eye. He has suggested that the conflict is being fueled by international actors. To my left is the Yemeni human rights activist and researcher Barash Shaban. He believes the crisis will only be resolved when all parties return to the negotiating table. And finally, Natasha Ezro, a senior lecturer at the Department of Government at the University of Essex. She blames the West for inaction which has only made the crisis worsen. Uh, today we are looking at if and how this war can be ended. Who do you think or what do you think is the greatest block on achieving peace in Yemen? The Saudi coalition, Saudi-led coalition. Um, the uh, people of Yemen and the national dialogue earlier the, uh, before the uh, Saudi campaign started had reached an agreement to implement a new constitution even though quite a few people were unhappy with a lot of it, but to avoid bloodshed, they grudgingly agreed to it. 
Um, unbeknownst to everybody, the uh, Saudi-led coalition just started its uh, ruthless campaigns that's been going on for two and a half years, which has created the world's worst humanitarian disaster, man-made humanitarian, humanitarian disaster. You've seen, you've told us the figures today. It is very worrying, it's very frightening, where you have half a million people suffering cholera as a result of the blockade imposed by the Sa Saudi-led coalition. So if the people were able to reach an agreement on their own, under UN supervision, with Jamal Ben Omar helping them, then the same people can go back to the table and sort out their mess. What is going, what was causing the trouble is the Saudi-led coalition. Um, I, I, I would slightly disagree. Uh, yes, there are, of course, uh, um, numerous uh, civilian casualties caused by the Saudi-led coalition, but what she didn't mention, actually, who blocked the transition was the former president and the Houthis. So we were moving towards a new constitution. I participated in the national dialogue myself, and we were very close to, to, to having the referendum. What happened is actually a coup happened in September 2014 because you had the former president in the country uh, um, basically weaponizing and arming the, uh, the Houthi rebels who finally took control over the capital. At that stage, they didn't feel actually they need to, 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 uh, to have a referendum or, have a, uh, or, or have, a new, uh, have a new constitution because simply they can achieve by weapons what they couldn't achieve in, in, uh, on, the, on the negotiation table. I am table. sorry, but that in is... In essence, he's saying actually it's no. not the Saudis, it's the Houthis. No, 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 no. He is, uh, with the greatest respect, brother, you are being here, partisan here. Um, I'm uh, having to say this to you point blank there. We need to step aside for a minute and think carefully. When the uh, coalition, the Houthi, uh, what you call Houthi is Ansarullah basically, along with their partners, came to Sana'a and seized the capital in September 2014, that was as a response to the failure of uh, Mr. Hadi and his lot for implementing the Gulf Initiative and its terms and having extended his period by another year. He can I ask still, you? But let can me I ask finish. You? No, let can me can finish, I ask you one question here? Let me finish what, because what, I will come. What, I will, I will what let is, you. What is, sorry. What is the, let me finish. I'll give you okay. the chance to say your piece. Okay. okay. okay go ahead. Come uh, January 2015, that's when the Movimpic Peace and uh, Cooperation or Peace and uh, Partnership Agreement has been reached. Jamal Ben Omar reports to uh, UN Security Council on 27th April 2015 to say all the parties had now reached an agreement, thereby contradicting that it was, the, it was it, he actually said it if, uh, plainly, if it hadn't been for the Saudi intervention, the situation would have been settled. Well, just, just, just me. Otherwise, I'm second. sorry. If, if we could just uh, yeah. get uh, a different view. David, you have uh, reporters all over Yemen. Which of these accounts do you find most accurate? Um, I don't put all the blame on the Saudis. I think a large amount of the blame has to go on the Saudis. Um, uh, but there are, the problem with Yemen is uh, it has been a target of multiple interventions um, and changing sides. Um, I think one of the things that happened um, under King Abdullah was that uh, the Houthis were encouraged to uh, um, move against Sana'a because the target then was Isla. And Isla was supposed to up, uh, rise up and fight against the Houthis. And it was uh, an, another one of these uh, uh, devilish plots and gains that didn't work. Isla didn't fight at that particular time. It's very complicated. I'm not sure that you can take any one point in history and simply say that's when the conflict started okay. because there were, there, 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 were, there, were, there were other players involved. Iran was definitely involved. The Saudis have played an extremely dirty game. I absolutely agree with you. And I, yeah. I do agree with you that uh, the, when we're coming to the future, it has to be a Yemeni-based future. The Yemenis yeah, themselves have to bring in Natasha for, and, and just uh, refine the question back to the original, which is, which party is currently the greatest stumbling block to peace? Right, well, I mean, I, I can see both sides that Houthis have also committed atrocities, but the biggest stumbling block are the Saudis, because once they got involved in the conflict, the number of civilian casualties just went up astronomically. And though it's not to say that there were, you know, some sides that uh, haven't committed atrocities as well, we see that because there's a blockade, then that's led to a massive humanitarian crisis because the price of food has gone up by 60%, that people don't have access to food, and therefore we have a major uh, um, possibility of a famine uh, with severe cases of malnutrition. Uh, and so I think that 
in terms of the greater scheme of things, we have to put blame on the Saudi coalition and, and, and the damaging effects that it has had in the last two years. Which takes us to the other player, which is selling a great deal of weapons to the Saudis, which I know you're very critical of, the United States. Well, the U.S.'s policy towards Yemen has been sort of going back and forth to, in terms of whatever suits their needs. They've been a supporter of Saleh when it suited them uh, and then changed their minds about it when it didn't suit them. And at the moment, they're supporting Saudi Arabia by helping them with fuel, helping them refuel, selling them weapons, selling them weapons that have more of the ability to uh, target civilians. Um, and now they're claiming they're going to amp up their involvement in Yemen, which I can't imagine is going to help. Well. For me, I think there's, there's no doubt that actually Saudi Arabia takes its part of the blame. Yes, especially in the northern part of the country, most of the civilian casualties have been caused by the uh, Saudi, Saudi air campaign. But the absence of a political uh, 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 transition will ultimately lead to a conflict. And this is exactly what happened in September 2014. When she's talking about the move and pick, what you don't know, I was there in the move and pick. Hadi was being bombed by uh, Yemeni uh, jet fighters. Uh, by the Houthis and uh, by the Houthis and Saleh forces, I don't think that's actually a, that's not how negotiations are supposed to happen. You don't have uh, 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 jet fighters bombing a presidential palace and say actually we're negotiating. What was supposed to happen actually they were supposed to hold on and wait until a final deal was supposed to come uh, to, to come out. We were very close to the to the uh, to the constitution, and I agree with David. Yes, at the end of the day, we need to have a, it should be a Yemeni led uh, a Yemeni led uh, Yemeni led process. But you can't have that when one side of the conflict having uh, weapons and actually pushing their way from one province to another. I went when the, the, the uh, after they, they, they seized control over Sana'a to the uh, province of, uh, of, of Beva and Taiz. They commit horrific atrocities. And I can say that actually this was a, 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 a good ground for, for negotiations. What we asked them back then was actually to wait, and that was before the intervention of the Saudis, and actually uh, allow the, uh, the uh, negotiating sides to actually reach a final, uh, final, uh, a final uh, decision on how can we elect a new, uh, new government. And, I, and, and even today, I think the Saudis need to compromise, Hadi needs to compromise, and the Houthis need to compromise, because I don't think there is a, a total military win to this, uh, to this conflict. Well, you, I beg to d disagree there. You see, I'm not taking my information from any party to the conflict in Yemen. Or, or, or the Saudi coalition. I'm taking it from the most reliable source, and that is Jamal Ben Omar, who is a UN envoy, who is independent from all these parties, and he reports that there was a clear agreement as of January 2015. I have seen the signed agreement with my own eyes. I actually got a copy in my file here. Okay. I also have a lot of other evidence to, to confirm uh, that uh, the Saudi regime wasn't happy with Yemen becoming democratic and independent. The use of Iran is a label because you will find that Iran, Iranian Shias and Yemeni Shias are not the same. These are Zaydis, these are Twelvers. They don't have the same way of doing things. The Zaydis are actually closer to the Sunni uh, majority. And in Ansarullah itself, you find not just Shia or Zaydis, you find other uh, Muslims such as uh, Hani, uh, Hanafis, you will find Sun uh, Shafiris, David, you'll find Sufis. David, what, what do your reporters make on the ground of, of Iran's uh, role there? Well, uh, honestly, you don't get that information uh, on the ground. Um, these things come from intelligence uh, uh, reports. Uh, as you say, some of the information is very, very suspect. Um, you also get it from Iran's uh, own reactions. There was, there was one in particular, this, this, this caused a lot of stir amongst the Sunni community when a, when a, uh, a, a deputy in, in the Majlis got up at one point and said, Iran is in control of four Arab capitals. That didn't help the situation. Um, mm. Whether that's propaganda, whether he was talking uh, for uh, one, uh, Iran is also a constellation of right wing and other forces, um, whether he was just talking for one group or not. They, they, cumulatively, there's, there, there is evidence that um, uh, uh, the Houthis have been modeled in particular uh, on Hezbollah, uh, and there were Hezbollah operatives there. There's also some evidence historically of uh, weapons training uh, and, and, and political training as well over a long period. But as I say, this doesn't actually help us get forward. What we need to get forward yeah. is a Yemeni solution yeah. to this problem. Agreed. Okay, Agreed. But the United Nations, I mean, uh, Natasha, you, you've done some work with them. You know, uh, would you be critical of their role? I mean, they seem to be very quiet 
about Yemen? Well, it's not necessarily that they're quiet. It's just that it's very difficult to do anything. Um, and in fact, a lot of UN workers have had to leave because the situation is so dangerous. And they've been putting out all kinds of publications about the situation in Yemen and what a crisis it is, and focusing on how do we rebuild after conflict and how do we deal with nations in conflict. Um, but ultimately, it is really great powers uh, like the U.S., Saudi Arabia, that once they get involved, it makes it very difficult for the U.N.'s work to make much of an impact. Do you think the UN's doing enough? I mean, uh, what about more um, peace um, talks? Why don't they arrange more, more like they do with Syria? It is, it is regrettable. It is regrettable that the UN hasn't been um, able, for whatever reason I can't explain, to do its job properly because of the uh, humanitarian uh, situation. Uh, the, the first step to do is to get the country actually out of Chapter uh, 7. If we analyze the legal scenario, and this is not just my opinion, I've got a team of international lawyers and experts, barristers in this country, from the US and from uh, European countries, all agreeing with the same uh, analysis, that, namely that uh, a de facto government which has been uh, perfected uh, by de jure process in Sana'a has come into existence, the Supreme Council. We now need to uh, deal with them to, to bring an end to this, because we may not like the fa faction in it, like a Houthi, or we may not like Saleh, uh, we may not like somebody else. It isn't about who we like and who we don't like, it's about how can we Tried fix this situation. Before, Barrow, they didn't go anywhere. Well, the issue is the UN only deals with the situation um, as it is today. Um, and um, if, uh, if they couldn't succeed, they'll, they will only, you know, try to, to, to do what is possible. In 2013, there was a possibility of having a more comprehensive national, uh, national dialogue. Uh, today, the, today the situation is quite uh, is quite uh, is quite different, and 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 uh, and again, the recent approach of the UN envoy, I think it's it's uh, it's more realistic. It required uh, the the Houthis to 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 disarm and, and and leave the capital in exchange for the political arrangements, which will ultimately lead for Hadi and his deputy uh, to leave power. There needs to be a compromise from uh, from uh, from uh, from both sides. Now they can propose that initiative, but actually, for example, the Houthis said no. The, the, the UN can't say, actually, we're going to impose something. They, can, they don't have um, a way to enforce uh, that, uh, that, that, that solution on the, on the, uh, on the uh, parties of the... That's true, uh, isn't parties it? Of they the don't have much power. They don't have a, much of a budget. I mean, the peacekeeping mm. budget is like the same budget uh, mm. for the city of Amsterdam. So we're looking at a completely like, uh, different um, set of powers here in terms of what the UN can do. Um, and, and, and there's always a lot of complaints about, oh, the UN needs to do more, yeah. but they're really hamstrung by, a, they have a very tiny budget and there's all kinds of political factors that make it very difficult for what they're supposed to do in, in, in terms of taking sides as well. well gonna, yes, go. I mean, I think one of the problems is that both sides are fissuring. Uh, there's been a major fallout between Hadi and uh, Mohammed bin Zayed. Um, and that the forces that, that the so-called so liberation forces that took over Aden Airport have, uh, are, are now loyal to the Emirates, they're not loyal to Hadi. So Hadi has lost that. And on the other side, there is a, 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 a very important fissure between, uh, or breakup between the Houthis so and, the and Salah. Uh, Salah right. is now called traitor, um, and uh, um, in fact, there was a sort of gunfight at a Houthi checkpoint. Uh, which involved killing four people, including one quite senior colonel in, in Sada's party. But that, of course, has been engineered in a sense by, by and the Americans w wanted that. It, it's unclear again, this is the law of unintended consequences, what's going to happen as a result of that. Um, Why would the Americans want that? Well, the Americans, uh, to, to, because it, it was always said that the, the Sada provided an awful lot of the legitimacy uh, in areas where the Houthis didn't have natural uh, control. But um, so it, it's obviously a, a counterinsurgency technique to split the sides of what they regard as an insurgency. Okay. Let's, let's talk about this uh, as being described as the forgotten war, uh, as it is sometimes described. It is underreported. I think uh, everyone here would agree. Why do you think that is, David? It's just very, very difficult to get in there. Um, everyone wants a piece of the action. Um, everyone's stopping independent reporters. Uh, the reporters we have there often have to file anonymously because uh, they're frightened of the consequences. Uh, um, there are, it, it's extremely difficult to report independently on, 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 on what 
a controlling militia doesn't want you to see in a particular area. Uh, Kim and Barry, you're, you're but both... That, that uh, wasn't yeah. the experience with, for example, the Channel 4 crew that went there, ITV crew that went there, uh, Andrew uh, Mitchell, our own MP, went there, a whole lot of others went there. Who, gets ob ob who obstructs the uh, uh, journalists or journalism or people telling about what's actually happening inside Yemen? It's the Saudi-led coalition. Quite a lot of journalists have been targeted directly by Saudi uh, enough, airstrikes. And also there are others who are in custody because... The, there are thousands uh, in custody uh, by well, the Houthis. I, heard, you know, I heard about you know, those. thousands of journalists I have, have I have raised their issue. I have investigated, raised yeah. Issue. You I know there is a very, journalist very being sentenced to death people. as we speak. Yeah, I said that we are very concerned about these people. They have a right to uh, roam large, they told us. We have a state of emergency and these people are harming national security. And so we're you think that's legitimate to, them. to actually but sentence them to death? But that is the answer death? I got. That is the answer I got. Nevertheless... No, do you think that's the, legitimate? I don't, do you think I don't. I don't. I don't. And I, I, I call. I call upon an international investigation, investigation immediately upon... All, the, all that's going on in Yemen. Why are we not allowing the world to know this? Uh, what, what's happening? The Saudi coalition has been targeting civilians deliberately. I have got the statistics with me. I have counted up to 800, 2,000 schools, 2,000 schools and education centers. Why would you be doing that? Um, 2,000, uh, 1,500 Barrow, food why would they be doing that? Places. Well, why? The, to punish the civilians. This is, this is a, to a make very them submit. scenario. The, 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 the actions of the Saudis should be condemned. And I think this is what, so something all of us should, uh, sh should agree. That doesn't mean that the other side's uh, actions are legitimate. For example, when the situation was happening in Pakistan, the wrongdoings of the, uh, of the Pakistani government towards the Taliban doesn't make the Taliban a legitimate force okay. and whether actions legit legitimate. Today, th like every day we have uh, people being executed in squares in Sana'a. That never happened in the okay. past. Right. Uh, and the number of, of journalists, activists, uh, human rights workers uh, being thrown in prison almost on a, daily, on a daily basis. That's very worrying to me as a Yemeni who lived all my life inside Yemen. That wasn't the situation So the that situation explains well, the, they uh, say to some extent the unreported. We have one, one final point I'd like to get from each yeah. of you before we run out of time, right. which is what singular thing has to happen mm -hmm. uh, to end the war? And can it be ended? And if I could start with you, Natasha. Well, that's a really difficult question, and I think we've already kind of come on some of the answers about the fact that it needs to be driven by um, Yemen, uh, the people of Yemen themselves, and that by having foreign powers telling them what to do, this we've had these kind of things happen in the past, and when it's really driven by foreign powers, it doesn't tend to really work. Um, and I think the bigger problem, though, is what was going on in Yemen could have been resolved much earlier. Um, it was already failing, it was already sort of collapsing as a state. There was already a massive potential humanitarian crisis that was taking place that was just being ignored. And that is going to be the seeds think, for a conflict. You, you think the, the Yemenis can sort it out themselves, if left alone? I think that this is the only thing we know is that when international powers try to get involved and sort it out, it doesn't really work. David? Well, I think Bin Salman who uh, is turning out to be uh, a, an extremely uh, dangerous uh, future king, the Saudi king, uh, who is impulsive and reckless uh, and who already has quite a lot of blood on his hands, has to de actually decide to uh, stop the bombing campaign, which he initially sold as a campaign that would be surgical and quick, and he now is going around Washington saying, I want out of Yemen. So he actually has to uh, actually be true to his word. That's the first thing that has to happen. Second thing that has to happen is disarmament. And uh, I, I do think the Houthis have to disarm at the same time as uh, uh, with promises. I do think that it has to be Yemen-driven. Let me, let me get, we'll get back to you for a minute, Barrow, then. What, what do you make of that? Do you think that's possible? That is possible, actually, because, I mean, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no war that can uh, last, uh, last for, uh, forever. Uh, many forces are uh, already, uh, already um, exhausted. So I think uh, um, uh, things should happen in, uh, in, in parallel, and actually the process that stopped in 2014 should resume. So we should um, have a, a process where the Houthis uh, 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 need to disarm and leave the capital. In exchange, Hadi and his deputy needs to agree to step down uh, for uh, choosing a new uh, a new uh, leadership, 
Can this could happen today, this could happen a year from now, or this could happen two years from now. Can the choice that we have is actually saving well, more am, civilian casualties. I am, I am, but the suggestion that one <coughs> particular party should disarm just like that uh, is actually unrealistic for the welfare of the country as a, 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 at large because compare the south to the north for example the south it was they who said come and rescue us because there was terrorists akab and daesh wreaking havoc in that's the south. not true likewise that's not true. let me finish that's not Abul true Abbas. to stop you that that's Abul not true Abbas is uh, akab and Daesh, so is Lua Sa'ali. They are the ones who are wreaking havoc in Ta'ez and taking photographs of the civilians they kill and they say this is, this is what Houthi has but, done. Can, so just how can point, we disarm these you, people by yeah. saying to the national uh, 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 army and its coalition partners, which is led by the, by the Ansarullah, we can't tell them disarm and leave the country to terrorists. In, in sum, do you see yeah. the war ending anytime soon? Very much indeed. We just need a UN resolution imposed on the Saudi coalition okay. to just get out of, uh, of Yemen affairs, hands of Yemen, because Kim. we have a tribal system and I'm confident we can sit we together. Had that thank, you. Before, thank you very much. That they is the, uh, before, thanks yeah. for the Houthis, they collapsed the whole process. We had well, that they system. Came to we had the constitution. From Daesh and Akka, no, they didn't. And they've done no, a they great didn't. job. They, they, thank they you very much. We have to run this out, unfortunately. And we will continue this another day, I'm sure. One thing that we can all agree on is, given the humanitarian situation ending this war now, is more pressing than ever. This has been Roundtable with me, Matthew Moore. Thank you for watching, goodbye.